Okay, we're going to wade now into femto uh, surgery, and Dan Reinstein is going to talk to us about corneal surgery using only a femtosecond laser. Thank you, thank you, George, and and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this uh, really great symposium for two days here. So. Um, I have financial disclosures in that I'm, I've been a consultant to Carl Zeiss for um, 10 years and I have uh, been developing ultrasound scanning uh, for 20 years and I'm going to be speaking about those, both those topics uh, this afternoon. Um, just downstairs, I should have used a, a knee slide. Um, there's a knee convention on the third level and uh, as most of us in this room at medical school would have Clark patients in for um, cholecystectomy would know that the patient was going to be in for three weeks with a huge 18 inch incision, drains coming out, lots of ugly colored fluid and it was very ugly operation. It's now done through three little holes in the abdomen and the patient goes home in the evening. And in a way this is what is now being made possible by femtosecond uh, lasers in the cornea. Um, this is an edited video of a smile procedure uh, where um, the underside of a lenticule is cut in 3D within the cornea. The overside of the refractive component is cut and overpassed to reach the edge where we can make a small incision and then the superior and inferior edges of the lenticule are identified and then the little bridges are separated from above um, and then below the lenticule. And then we um, simply deliver the uh, lenticule out through the small incision. And in this case, it was a boy. So let me just show you quickly about the outcomes because that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about why I think all corneal I think all refractive surgery except for the outliers is going to go this way. And these are outcomes from our um, sister center in, uh, at the Tilganga Institute in Nepal where uh, Dr. Kishore here who is a fellow of mine in London and we went and set up a um, thanks to the generosity of some uh, donors amongst my patients. We set up a center in Nepal uh, where Kishore did his very first refractive surgical procedure was actually a smile procedure, and his second ever procedure was a LASIK. So it's almost like going straight to mix uh, and bypassing all other you know, cataract techniques. The outcomes of smile now are, you know, completely comparable to LASIK. As you can see here from the R squareds, they're completely similar. Um, if we look, however, at SMILE, we're able to treat very much higher levels of myopia with a lot more accuracy than we can with an eczema laser. Um, and if we look at the comparable ranges up to minus eight, you can see that the outcomes are pretty much identical uh, between LASIK and SMILE now, um, as is the safety and as is the one-day visual recovery. Uh, we compare um, controlled, uh, match-controlled eyes. So the, the RELAX has really reached a point where now it is certainly a substitute for LASIK and I'm going to give you in the next few minutes the arguments why it is the substitute uh, for LASIK in the future. And there are really two areas. The first one is this dry eye area which um, is not really dry eye. It's actually a neuropathy and uh, I'd encourage you to pull um, Ilpu Twisko's PhD off the internet and have a read because it totally deals with the fact that dry eye is not the issue, it's dry eye sensation. And it's due to the nerves. And of course in SMILE we are taking a lenticule from beneath the corneal um, nerve plexus and we're removing that without uh, affecting it as opposed to LASIK or PRK where we're operating inside the nerve plexus and therefore causing issues. So what we did was to start measuring esthesiometry um, before and after surgery with the Cauchy Bonnet esthesiometer. And uh, here's a series of 39 eyes in, uh, from myopia from minus 3 to minus 11 in whom we uh, measured these things. And then we took the late literature in LASIK studies for this, uh, this same esthesiometer and plotted an average of all of the values in the literature and showed that in SMILE this is actually uh, a much more favorable outcome. In LASIK, the esthesiometry is zero on day one, but it is 
uh, but halved only in smile, of course, because of a sort of neuropraxia from the manipulation, probably, of the nerves. And this recovers very, very quickly. If we, and, and of course, as you can imagine, all the subjective uh, things that come from having no cut nerves are going to be instantly benefited from. But let me spend the last five minutes talking about why the mechanics of this procedure are so much more favorable and why this is without question the way this is going to go. First of all, I want to be very clear, there is no way clinically today of doing biomechanical measurements in practice. And the ORA with its CRF, CRH, I wrote an editorial on this, effectively trying to discourage anybody from sending a, a, a paper with CH and CRF to the JRS because we will reject it without reading it. Because these parameters have been thrown about as biomechanical parameters and they're not. They don't really measure what we think they're. In fact, if they did, why don't they change after cross-linking? So, of course, um, the ORA does have a new multivariate 37 parameter factor, which may give us some indication of some of the mechanical properties of the cornea. And the Corvis from, from, uh, Ocul uh, from Oculus may also be giving us information, although we don't yet have numbers coming out of it. So the problem with studying biomechanics is we don't have a way of measuring biomechanics other than in the lab. And I will show a couple of studies from John Marshall uh, and Bradley Randleman in a second. So what we did was we said, let's use a parameter that correlates to biomechanics to measure the biomechanics. And Let's digress for one second. We all know that these myopic corrections have been inducing spherical aberration. Contrary to what we were told 10 years ago, which was that most of the effect of degrading in, in a sort of centrifugal way, degrading the ablation profile was because of projection errors and reflection errors, uh, right around 10 years ago, we were using high frequency ultrasound to measure the thickness of the stroma before and after LASIK, and the difference map, and finding that the th periphery of the cornea was thickening. Periphery of the stroma was thickening. And it was thickening a lot, a lot more than the cosine rule projection errors that were being uh, blamed for the spherical aberration. So this particular error in biology in our cornea is responsible for the great increase in spherical aberration that we see in myopic corrections. And in fact, in this case, for example, it's a minus 5, 0.35 microns of spherical aberration just from the thickening of the peripheral cornea. And Cynthia Roberts, in the same issue that we published this, um, published her famous editorial, The Cornea is Not a Piece of Plastic, explaining why this happens. We're cutting fibers peripherally, getting peripheral expansion, and therefore degrading the ablation profile that we were intending. So if we go back to our model here, in LASIK, we're cutting down all of these fibers that are crossing the whole cornea, uh, you know, well into the cornea and leaving behind um, a, a residual for long-term safety, but creating expansion of tissue which causes spherical aberration. So we thought, well, if SMILE is working on the inside of the cornea, we would expect there to be less expansion and therefore less induction of spherical aberration. So we took a, a population of eyes, uh, this was presented at ARVA this year, where we, we looked at SMILE eyes and compared them to LASIK eyes that have been treated for the same refractive error, but with an extremely optimized ablation profile to, to minimize the induction of spherical aberration. And we compared these two groups. The way we did it was to plot the pupil size against the amount of spherical aberration induced. And as you can see, historically, from a 5 millimeter Munderland minus 6 ablation, it was an astronomical increase in spherical aberration within the 6 millimeter zone as the pupil got larger. This got significantly better as we increased the zone to 6 even better when we did the initial optimization of introducing precompensation for spherical aberration induction. And when we optimize it fully, we're getting to very low levels of induced spherical aberration. If it really optimized, I say, because if we had optimized with any more precompensation, we start to induce central islands. Many, many Wavelight users have seen that pushing the slider too far. So back to the study, we measured the spherical aberration change on the atlas aberrometer in the smile eyes and showed that the smile versus the laser blended vision optimized profile performed exactly the same, even though the smile profile was just a spherical profile and the LBV profile was a highly optimized precompensated spherical aberration profile. So given that they act the same, it means that smile is producing less biomechanical effect. 
Now, if we go to the to the lab, John uh, just published a group. Uh, uh, John's group just published a, uh, this brilliant paper where he used cardiac cycle simulation in bank eyes that he keeps alive for a month and made cuts and showed that the stress strain, the, 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 the stress induced in the cornea through a nine, 90 micron flap is a 9% increase, increase in strain of 9, 9%. If the flap is 160, the increase is 32%. But then he just did an experiment where they cut only the side cut of 90 and found a 9% increase, and just the side cut, also a 33% increase. Finally, they did the delamination only and found that there was only a 5% increase in strain if, the, if there was no side cut at all. So this, in conjunction with the relatively old paper now from 2008 from Brad Randleman, where he showed that the tensile strength of the anterior cornea it goes down, it is about 10 times stronger than the posterior cornea, and that the relationship is linear. So if we go to thinking about what we're doing in the cornea here, we're cutting these flaps, so cutting peripheral fibers, we're cutting to down into the ablation, into the, say, center of the cornea, and leaving behind certain fibers, which we know is fine and safe for the long term. But in SMILE, we're taking these cuts from the center of the cornea. And so what we're leaving behind now is the posterior, which we knew, but also the anterior cornea, which is much stronger. And we showed that there's less induction of spherical aberration per profile with SMILE. And so now this is totally taking us into a new realm where our, our, our way of thinking about stability and what we can do in a cornea has totally changed. A 500 micron cornea with a 150 micron ablation with a 100 micron flap leaves 250 as a sort of like a legal case. But if we were to create a 130 micron cap, 50 of which is epithelium, 80 of which is stroma, and we add the 80 stroma of the anterior to the residual 220, we're now going to leave the cornea with 300 of stroma. But that 300 of stroma comprises 80 from the front, which is at least one and a half times stronger than what we were counting from the back. So in real terms, LASIK terms, we're leaving an effective strength of 340 microns with the same 150 micron removal of tissue. So as you can see, smile gets better the deeper you go inside the cornea because you're exchanging posterior fibers for anterior. It's like exchanging Canadian dollars for American dollars, you know, which I think is now reversed. Anyway, so in, in summary, visual recovery time is similar to LASIK now, and so that, that's all out of the way. All of this dry eye stuff, which takes huge amounts of chair time for the surgeon, but let's be clear, it's a lot of stress for patients post-operatively. Uh, we can pretty much kiss it goodbye. And the greater biomechanical post-op tensile strength is something which we're going to be able to play on to push the limits of refractive surgery way beyond what we thought was reasonable with an eczema laser, and in fact make the procedure a lot safer and a lot better for the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dan, can, there's a question from the audience here. Uh, can you go the opposite direction and fix small amounts of myopia, and can you do a hyperopic correction with SMILE? Um, right. So currently, um, with the SMILE technique, uh, we can correct minus one. And the way we do it is not by creating a 12 micron lamella in a six millimeter zone. What we do is we thicken that uh, tissue removal by using a seven millimeter zone, by putting a, it on a pedestal of 20 microns, by including a transition zone. And so we make sure that these lamella are at least about 65 to 70 microns thick. So we can correct up to, down to about minus one now. And in hyperopia, the answer is yes, there, the trials in hyperopia have uh, been ongoing, but that is still not commercially released, but um, there's no reason why it won't be possible to do it. Uh, then would you please comment on the correction of uh, astigmatism and on uh, enhancements? Yeah. Well, the correction of astigmatism, um, I, was, I was only given 10 minutes, so I didn't, leave the, I didn't really do too much outcomes analysis here. The astigmatism correction um, 
is as accurate as that you'd expect. Remember, and I tell this to patients, the smile is not a new procedure. It's the old procedure, but through a keyhole. There's nothing new about it. The profile of tissue removal has been calculated by Barraquer in 1948. So there's nothing new about smile. That's why astigmatism works great. That's why myopia works great. Because it's the same procedure. The only difference is we're not creating a big old flap to access the inside of the cornea, or we're not ablating through the anterior cornea with its nerve plexus, creating a, a maelstrom of inflammatory uh, healing, uh, 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 you know, that's like, like a party of inflammation at the front of the cornea, and also leaving the cornea susceptible to UV exposure and haze formation for the rest of your life. So if effectively, it is, to answer your question, it's the same because it's the same. Yeah. The enhancements? Enhancements, well, that, and now, that because we can't really correct below minus one with a lenticule extraction, unfortunately, enhancements will need to be done currently either as a LASIK procedure or as a PRK procedure, both of which are mm, 37 million eyes down the road time tested. So you lose the advantage of the keyhole, but remember, we have 96 to 97 percent of patients 2020. So the enhancements only applies to a small number. Question from the audience, Dan. Uh, is there concern about haze and fibrosis in the zone where the uh, lenticule is removed? Yeah. Uh, no. And uh, what we have not seen, what has been described, um, and of course, remember, that's a very good question because here we're cutting two times with the femtosecond laser, creating two rough surfaces, let's say, as opposed to uh, with a femto eczema procedure where you've got one rough surface on the inner side of the flap and then the eczema polishing the surface of the stroma down. Uh, the answer is we haven't seen rainbow syndrome and we don't see very much in the way of TLS. Uh, which are syndromes that were described with the most common uh, femtosecond lasers, probably because the amount of energy that we're using with the Visumax is so much smaller. It's about a tenth of the amount of energy per pulse. Uh, the spot size is about a tenth the size as well. Do you so, see strii from a mismatch of the the curve of the anterior and yeah. posterior layers? Yeah, yeah, that's a great that's a great uh, question, particularly as the paper that came out saying that strii and high myopia after LASIK are because of the mismatch, I believe is wrong because when you cut a flap, the peripheral fibers retract and the bed gets larger. And I think that in LASIK, if you get strii, it's because you didn't put the flap back properly. But in this procedure, you are not cutting the anterior lamellae and you do have to put the redundant tissue in the periphery. Otherwise, it will, con it will condense in the center and you will get microfolds. So that, that's a good question. Thank you very uh, much, Dan. I've got one question. Question? Okay? Yeah, uh, you know, you're talking about you have two rough surfaces. And so I haven't seen the Visumax, but I've seen two other femtosecond lasers. And not always, but periodically you have little ridges in the bed. And in this particular procedure, mm -hmm. you'd have a corkscrew. So it would appear to me that periodically you're going to degrade the quality of the optics if you have an irregular... Uh, pattern between the, uh, you know, the uh, pulses as they go around. You're going to have a break between the lines. Yeah, Frank, that's, um, see all these questions are, are great questions, uh, but uh, it, it, they're kind of answered, if we like, uh, with these slides, which I prepared earlier. But, you know, the whole point here is that large scale curvature changes are affected because the cornea can't compensate for them. But when you have high frequency noise and you have lamellae sitting over them, I don't know if you can show the slides on the, on the screen there while, I, while I'm flicking through here. Can everybody, could you put the slides up that I've got here on the projector? Because you have a cap sitting on, if you have a cap sitting on large scale undulations, you get undulations. But as this frequency of these undulations gets higher, the cap creates more and more smoothing. And so only the large scale undulation, which is the myopic correction, is showing through. The small scale high frequency noise is filtered by the fact that you have 130 microns of cap. And there are, 
equations here which demonstrate, based on cap thickness, how much smoothing you're going to get based on the uncertainty of the positioning of the spots. So while you are right theoretically that that could be a, com a, like a compromising issue, certainly it would be if we were cutting, doing a PRK. In other words, if we were cutting an anterior lenticule and removing it and expecting the epithelium to grow over that, that would cause a lot of scatter. But within the cornea, cornea and with a cap, sm doing a low-pass filter effect over that slightly irregular uh, surface, there is no issue. And actually, one of the studies we have ongoing, it's not, it's not, we haven't broken code or anything yet on this, but we're looking at the sequent values, in other words, the amount of light scatter, and we're measuring this longitudinally before and after surgery, and finding that it is not affected any more than it is in LASIK. Great explanation. Thank you.